Good morning, Oak Grove. Stand with us and join in our worship this morning. Identify not physical. Well, good morning, Oak Grove. We welcome you this morning. So glad that you're here. We know that God has an awesome morning planned for you this morning. First service went great. Just excited for you to hear what the Lord has for you this morning. So let's pray and we'll continue our worship together. Lord God, we just thank you for everyone here, our Oak Grove family and friends and new faces. Lord, we welcome you everyone here today. Lord, you have them here for a reason and a purpose. You have called them. I pray that you will open up their hearts and minds, ears and eyes to hear your word this morning and to worship fully in your presence this morning, Lord, regardless of what's going on around us, what's going on at home, what's going on in our nation. Lord, with you as our Lord and Savior, we already have the victory 
no matter what fight, no matter what battle we're facing. And we praise you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the
gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Good morning, Oak Grove Church of God. Boy, it's exciting to be here. And, and I'll tell you, uh, we, we took care of first service, went great. Um, I, I'll tell you what I told them. I'm really excited about this morning because of how hard the devil fought me all week long. And that is no joke. He fought me all week long right up until this morning, about 3 o'clock in the morning. I, I had some stuff going on. I had an issue with my eye that was really, normally causes me to have to rush to my friend who's an eye doctor and get medications and stuff. And I said, God, look, either you gave me this message and I'm supposed to deliver it or not. And I got to know one way or the other. And man, within 15 minutes, my eye quit hurting. I fell back asleep. Now, it was bloodshot. It was pink. I mean, it was bad. I woke up. My eye was clear. No pain. And I'm ready to deliver the message that God has for the church this morning. So, um, we have a, a post-COVID way of greeting. But anyway, um, if, you, if you feel comfortable and the two of you are in agreement, if you want to shake hands and hug, great. Other than that, we now do what Pastor Steve calls the wave offering. So, greet one another in the Lord. I am, uh, I'm, I'm excited and blessed this morning that uh, my Uncle Tim and Aunt Sandy are with us, and I'm really excited about that. My, my mom's brother and uh, two wonderful people who love the Lord very much and were very influential in my uh, young life, and uh, uh, you will find out quickly that where some of my twisted sense of humor comes from if you spend any time talking to my Uncle Tim. So um, we're going we're gonna to have a prayer. Uh, let's have the kids come to the middle, and I'll dismiss them. I do want to uh, make mention of a couple of, of things which I would like for the church to pray about. Um, we had two families this week that lost uh, young husbands and uh, fathers. Uh, Jim Elder was in a car accident. He was age 44. He leaves behind a wife and four daughters. And Dustin Wood, who was 42 at work, had a heart attack left behind a wife and two sons, so uh, we want to remember them in your prayers this week. So let's pray for our kids and dismiss them. God, I thank you for these kids. God, they're so awesome. Lord, you have blessed this church with so many young people, and we know, God, that they are the church of the, today. They're the leaders of our church tomorrow. And so, God, as they go forward now to their classrooms, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would speak into each and every life. God, I pray for the teachers, Lord, that the words that they speak would be your words, that it would change these lives, that they would make a difference in the world around them in the years to come. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, dismissed. And youth, you can depart as well. Over to the hall with you. I'll mention that uh, Pastor Steve and Pam are spending some uh, wonderful time with family over in Ohio, and, and we're excited about that. I, I love it when he gets a chance to get away and be with his family. You know, we're, we're very, very blessed in our family. Um, we, uh, at least once a week, uh, my parents get to be involved in their grandchildren's lives. And Pastor Steve does not have that opportunity, so I'm always glad when he gets a chance to go over and spend time with his grandsons. So remember them today. Hi, Steve. Hi, Pam, because I know they're watching. Um, before the day is over, he's going to be doing this. I know he is. So, all right. Uh, off, last thing, offering. There's a basket there in the back. So um, if you uh, wish to give, and if you don't wish to give, the Bible tells you to give anyway. Uh, there's the offering basket back there. So let's continue. that you will receive this message this morning.
be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.
be against us, Lord. We receive that blessing in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. For you. He is for you. And if God be for you, nobody, nobody, nobody can be against you. Um, I'm going to ask my dad. Um, I had the honor of praying for him before he preached, and so I'm going to ask him to come and pray for the message this morning. Yeah, you. My dad. Yeah. Come on up here and pray. <laughs> I sprung that on him. He, he was not prepared for that. So, But he knows the Word of God that says be instant in season and out, right? I do. <laughs> I do. Father, it's a privilege to be here among my brothers and sisters of Oak Grove Church of God. I, I've come to, through the, the years that we've been blessed to come here, uh, we have known what a wonderful group of men and women uh, and, and boys and girls that love the Lord. And Father, uh, be with uh, Brian today. People call him Hollywood. Father, you you know is that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. And we thank you, Father, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you that we follow Jesus and he makes us fishers of men. Amen. What a privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord today. Jesus is building his church. Amen. And today is another day on the Lord's day. We worship you, Father. And we thank you that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amen. I am so blessed. To have the heritage that I have, the spiritual heritage, and uh, the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, uh, we are very blessed. You, you may be seated. Sorry, I should have told you that. Yeah, stand for the whole service. No, just kidding. Um, so this morning, um, I, I want to, the, the title of my message is plan, it's a plan for the church in 2021 and beyond. So uh, 2020 was, was a difficult year for many. Uh, for some, it was a year of great blessing in the midst of a very strange and difficult time. Um, we were, oh my goodness, were we blessed this year. Um, I, I had lots of time off of work, um, and we were everything was fine for us financially. It allowed me time with my family that I don't get to normally have. It allowed uh, for me to do, get some projects done that I never have time for. Um, so it was, it was a great time in that regard, uh, but in the midst of it, I also lost a couple brothers in the Lord due to COVID. Um, one was with the Christian Motorcycle Association that I had known for years and years and years. He, he started out with CMA um, at, at the very beginning of CMA, and uh, we saw him at the Changes of the Colors rally in October, and we got home and a couple of months later, and he, he was with the Lord. Another one um, was our, our brother, Dwayne Basinger. And uh, I, uh, I loved Dwayne very, very much. And um, some of you may not know, he, he's one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. He was one of the first people I met when I graduated from college and I moved to Fort Wayne to work for Dana Corporation. Um, he and I worked together. And um, we established a relationship then that, that lasted for the rest of, of his life. And... Um, He's the reason that the Hayden family is, is in Oak Grove today. He, he was the one who invited us. So uh, if you're mad at him about that, get over it. He's in heaven. You can't do anything about it now. So, um, but in the midst of that loss, um, they were blessed. You know, uh, Dwayne's in heaven. <laughs> That's a blessing. Um, and we are blessed because we know we get to see him again. And so... Um, I, uh, I miss seeing Bev around here. Um, I don't know if you're watching, Bev, but if you are, we, we love you and we're praying for you and, and we miss Dwayne and, and we miss you being here with us. Um, so 2020 um, is, is a wrap. It's behind us. 
Uh, and now 2021 is, is starting out as kind of a year of uncertainty. You know, what will happen in our nation? Uh, what will happen to our rights and freedoms? What's going to happen to uh, our stock market? What's going to happen to our taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? There's a lot of things that are uncertain. But I have good news for you today. There is a plan for us to follow. Praise God. In a time of uncertainty, there's a plan, right? So we're going to go through that. There's three steps to this plan. They all start with the letter P, so you should be able to remember it by the end of the day. P, P, and E, okay? Careful how you say that. But step one is pray. It's the first step in our plan for 2021 and beyond. Pray. What's the purpose of prayer? Prayer is... Uh, it's it's a, for us a way to communicate with our Creator. It's how we worship our God. It's asking for God's will to be done. And it's making requests for ourselves and for others. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me. I'm still getting over some stuff that the devil tried to throw at me this week. So that's the purpose of prayer. Communicate with God. Worship God. Ask God for His will to be done, and making requests for ourselves and for others. Prayer is an important part of our relationship with God. It should be practiced and developed. Just like you learn to communicate with a close friend or uh, your spouse or uh, a co-worker, business uh, associate, communication is very important, and, and we need to develop that. Um, for those of you who are, are, are not aware, and I can't imagine there's anyone in this building that's not aware, that uh, we're big hockey fans in the Hayden household. And uh, we are Blackhawks fans. Go Hawks. And uh, there's others on the front row that are not Blackhawks fans, but that's okay. God extends grace to those who are yet to come into the light. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> and so what has happened um, in this past season was our, our goalie that we loved so very much, Corey Crawford, uh, he, they didn't sign him, and now he's since retired. So we have a new goalie, a um, uh, couple of, of goalies, uh, Malcolm Subban and um, Colin Delia. Well, Colin was, we were watching Friday night's game, and Colin, um, he went to retrieve the puck, and he kind of skated around, and, and the puck was here, and he stopped, and all of a sudden he did this really kind of awkward pass. And when he did, it went right to one of the Tampa Bay Lightning players. And so he tried to scramble to get around in front of the net, and when he did, he fell down, and the net was wide open, and Tampa scored. And the first thing the announcers said was there was a breakdown in communication. A breakdown in communication, yeah. And afterwards, when they were talking to, to Colin about it, he said, that, guys, he said, that was my fault. He, he said, I... I I'm not yet in tune with the team. We didn't communicate well. He said, I thought the player, our player was going to come around behind me and take the puck. So he was just kind of holding the puck for him to take. And the player was expecting Colin to pass. Well, by the time Colin figured that out and made this little awkward pass, it was too late. They, they weren't gelling. They weren't communicating well yet. So communication is very, very important. It's important in our lives. It's important in business. It's important in the sports that we play. <clears throat> And it's important that we need to develop and communicate with God, develop our, our relationship, develop ways to communicate with God and hear from Him. It impacts our lives and the lives of others. Prayer is an act of worship to God. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven... Your name be honored as holy. There's worship. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's asking for God's will to be done. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive, we have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Okay, there's where we're supplication. We're asking God for us and for others. And then, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It goes back to worship. Okay. Anybody feel like maybe 
Jesus knew what he was doing in prayer? Yeah. Well, right there, I just gave you the purpose of prayer, communicate with our Creator, worship God, ask for His will to be done, and making requests for ourselves and others. And, and Jesus modeled that in that prayer. He showed us how to do that. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. So step one is to pray. Step two, the second P of our three-step plan for 2021 is to prepare. Okay, we pray and then we prepare. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, right or correctly teaching the word of truth. Well, how can we do this? Well, we put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by His vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but, hear this, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. Hmm, that's where our battle is. This is why you must take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with the truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take the shield of faith, and with it you will be able to extinguish all the fiery arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word. Now, I want to point something out. The scriptures that we have today, when they were written, how many of you know the Apostle Paul did not sit down to write some of these letters and go, chapter 1, verse 1. No, that's not how he wrote, right? He's just writing as God inspired him, right? The chapter and verses were later added to help us to be able to find passages and, and study and things like that. And thank goodness for that, because can you imagine walking into church this morning, and I tell you, let's turn to the passage about the armor of God. And you've got a book that starts at what we know as Genesis 1, 1, and goes all the way to the end of Revelation, and there's no markings I just tell you, just turn there. You know where it is. Hmm. Okay, it'd be great if we had the Word of God memorized from cover to cover and knew it forwards and backwards and knew right where everything was at. That'd be great. I do not have this skill or talent or ability. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't have that. So they put the chapters and verses in later. The issue with that occasionally is a thought is slightly interrupted. So I'm, <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to read part of this passage again, and I'm going to pull out a verse number, and I'm going to change a lot, tiny little piece of punctuation, just, just a little, okay? So let's try this again, if you put it up there. This is why you must take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having prepared everything to take your stand, stand therefore. There's the complete thought. It doesn't end with, take your stand. New thought, stand therefore. No, 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 no. The thought is this. And having prepared everything to take your stand, stand therefore. Having prepared to take your stand, stand therefore. Okay? So what does that mean? It means don't sit down. Don't lie down. Don't give up. Don't back up. Don't back down. Don't get down. Stand Having prepared to take your stand, don't sit down, don't lie down, don't give up, don't back up, don't back down, don't get down. Stand. Stand. We don't have to do it. We stand. Now, I don't know anyone that has a Roman centurion set of armor. I don't. Sorry, I don't. I don't know anyone that has this shiny metal knight in shining armor suit. I don't know anybody that has that. 
okay? So, sorry. I don't know anyone that has a chain mail set. I'm, I'm out of luck on that. But I do know somebody that has a full set of modern armor. And I've invited them to come be with us today. All right? Now, I'm excited about this. So I'm going to pull this over here a little bit. So I would like for you to give a warm, and I mean exciting, resounding, warm Oak Grove Church of God welcome from the Fort Wayne Wild, number eight, Brennan Hayden. You are getting the full Open Throttle Ministries impact today, the full effect. Every member, uh, member of the Hayden household is involved in today's service. And if you ever come to an Open Throttles ministry event, you will understand that we are all involved in ministry together, and that's exciting. All right, so let's talk about the armor of God, okay? We have, what is it, folks? What's this? Of what? The helmet of salvation. There we go. Come on now. This is an illustration. We're talking about the whole armor of God. We have the helmet of salvation. We have breastplate of righteousness. Right. Underneath this long jersey, we have a belt that's cockeyed. And that is what? The belt of truth. Right. We have the shield, shield of faith. We have our feet. Shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we have, hold it up, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Now, you're going, really? Yeah, wait. It becomes clear. So, what do we do with this armor? Right? The Scripture says, to quench all the fiery pox of the enemy. Right? That's what the armor's for. Yeah, that's what the armor's for. All right. Now, let's take another look at the armor here. Let's, let's talk about this for a second. And I'm going to switch to beanbags for this part of the demonstration. You notice you will never, ever see a goalie guard his net facing the net. Right? You don't see that. Why is that? Well, let's find out. Are you ready? Yeah. You're sure? Yeah. You're ready? Okay, here we go. I thought you said you were ready. You are? Well, you don't seem to be ready. Okay, what's the first reason that we don't turn away? Take, take a guess. Somebody said it this morning. Can't see. There you go. You can't see the attack. You can't see where the attack is coming from. That's the first reason that we always face our attacker. We don't turn around. We don't back up. We don't back down. We do not turn our back on the enemy. Why? Because we can't see the attack coming. Okay. Let's, let's look again. What would be another reason why you would never turn your back? on the attack because there's nothing in the Bible that says anything about a rear end plate we don't have a rear end plate right we don't have a back protector right it's not in there there's nothing in there about a back, back protector we're vulnerable on the back side we don't have armor for the back side there's a reason for that God doesn't want us to turn our back. He doesn't want us to back down. He doesn't want us to go the direction the enemy goes. So, we're vulnerable. Again, that's why I'm using beanbags and not the hard rubber pucks. Because if you turn around, and these were pucks coming in at 40, 50, in the NHL, 100 miles an hour, that would hurt. Yeah, a lot, Yes. Okay? We're vulnerable. So we don't want to do that. 
Now, turn around, son. Let's again, let's take a quick look. We have the belt of truth. We have the chest protector. We have the shoes or the skates. We have the shield. We have the helmet. All of these, all of these parts of the armor are defensive. They're all defensive. But there's one other part of the armor. What is it? It's the sword. That's the only offensive tool we have. And just like in a hockey game, if you ever see a goalie drop his stick, the enemy knows it's time to go on the attack. And the team whose goalie has lost their stick, they're scrambling to get the goalie's stick back. And you would think, man, with all of that gear, how could the stick be that important? It's the only offensive tool that he's got. Now, guess what? With that offensive tool, and it can be used defensively too, just like you see in a sword fight. There's one guy on the offensive, there's one guy on the defensive. So the sword can be used as a defensive weapon as well. But let me tell you something, folks. It's an offensive weapon. A goalie wants to turn the game around and make a difference. The goalie will take his stick and he will fire the puck back to the other end. He will turn that attack on the enemy and deliver the puck to the other end for his team to score a victory. Everyone give him a hand. Thanks, buddy. So, what's fun for me today is after this message, if you are a hockey fan... Great, you will never again look at Ephesians chapter 6 without thinking about hockey. And if you know nothing about hockey, you don't like hockey, you will never again read Ephesians chapter 6 without thinking about hockey. <laughs> it's a win-win. <laughs> okay, so now we've talked about the armor of God. We've talked about preparing. We've talked about the sword being the word of God. What do we do with all this armor? Okay, so we've prayed, we've prepared. Now we sit back, relax, and wait for God to come back. Wait for the trumpet to sound and Jesus to get us out of here. Well, number one, that doesn't start with a P. And number two, it's not right. The third step in our plan for 2021 is proceed. Proceed. You pray, you prepare, and you proceed. Now, what does proceed mean? It means to begin and carry on an action, process, or movement. I got to tell you, I was so frustrated yesterday. I was amazed at this, that the number of Bibles I looked through, because I grew up with Bibles, that when you turn to the book of Acts, and this one does it, so I brought this one. Um, it says, the Acts of the Apostles. Now, without that, you just put Acts... What, did somebody misspell the tool that you chop a tree down with? No. There's a reason it's called Acts. And this particular Bible has the way I remember Bibles being as I grew up. And it says right here, the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles. Things they did. Now remember, Acts is Jesus has just ascended to the Father. In the very beginning of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes. This is the early days of the church. Early, early. Somebody say early. Early. Right. Jesus had 12 to start the church with, right? Not a lot. Okay. The book of, of Acts is a little less than, than 20 years. I've read resources that say 14, 18, somewhere in there. This is where Pastor Steve is going home like this because he knows it down to the hours, days, minutes, and seconds. But it's a little less than 20 years but we'll say 20 for the sake of the argument. And out of that, um, and, and this version of the Bible from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation is 1,508 pages. And out of that, 50 pages are dedicated to the Acts of the Apostles. Less than 20 years, there's an entire book, 50 pages long, 28 chapters about the Acts of the Apostles. Things they did. 
and there wasn't a lot of it. Why do I point that out? Well, I would ask this question. What has the Church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America done in the last 40 years? Could there be an entire book written? Or how about enough for a trifold four color pamphlet with pictures? Now I know that's stepping on some toes, it's stepping on my toes. Now I'm I'm thankful that we're part of Oak Grove Church of God and, and we do things here and we get involved. And just like at Christmas time, when when COVID changed so many things, Oak Grove took it upon themselves to act and to offer a drive through nativity for the community. And and we honored God with that, and God honored us with that. We want to act. It's time for us, the Church of Jesus Christ, to proceed, to begin and carry out action. At the end of, end of Jesus' time on earth, before sending the Holy Spirit, He gave us the great commission. But sometimes I feel like we've been practicing the great omission. Before going any further, let's take a look at three institutions that God has created for us. Number one is the home. God established the home almost immediately following the creation of the universe, and it is the building block of any functioning civilization. Genesis 2, chapter, or chapter 2, verse 24, says, This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. There are many portions of God's Word which address the purpose and practices of the home. But a concise mission statement is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, which says, These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Teach them to your children. A key word in the mission statement of the home is the word teach. We're supposed to teach in our homes. We're supposed to teach our children. And how can we teach them if we don't know? So we've got to be studied up, right? The second institution, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the second institution may surprise you. Government. God established civil government shortly after Noah and his family exited the ark after the worldwide flood. The first responsibility given to civil government is found in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, which says... Whoever sheds man's blood, his blood will be shed by man. For God made man in his image. The establishment of capital punishment is a sober and heavy responsibility. It establishes a primary purpose of government as the protection of its citizens. Ready for this? Beginning with the protection of the foundational right to life as a gift from God. Let me read that again. It establishes a primary purpose of government as the protection of its citizens, beginning with the protection of the foundational right to life. Seems like I've heard an organization that's maybe right, right to life. Yeah, yeah, woo, woo. Right to life. It's a gift from God. The third institution that God created for us is the church. God established the church with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone and the apostles as its foundation. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 describes the church as being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The mission statement of the church is found in Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20 which says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Again, the primary focus of this institution is to teach. And He's with us to the end of the age. We're not alone in this. He's with us to the end of the age. Let's take a closer look. We have been taught and believed that the Great Commission is to get people saved. 
Well, that is found in Mark chapter 16, starting with verse 15. And it says, Then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay, that's going out and getting people saved. But Matthew 28 gives us a different direction. Matthew 28 tells us that we are to make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of nations? That's what it says. What does that mean? Well, Jesus said, teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. We literally are supposed to teach the United States of America how to live according to the teachings of Jesus Christ. We're literally supposed to teach the United States of America, this nation. We're to teach them how to live according to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Amen? Isn't that what it says? Make disciples of all nations. Some have said that we're not supposed to get involved in politics and government. This is not, not sound biblical teaching. This is a deception of the enemy, Satan. Why do I know that? Well, let's take a look. Let's look at a few examples of God's people involved in politics and government, okay? Let's start with, how about Moses? The one that delivered the Ten Commandments, remember that guy? Kind of important in the Word of God, right? Moses was raised in the royal court as a prince of the Egyptians. Sounds to me like he was involved in government politics to me. How about you? Okay, How about Joseph, sold into slavery by his brothers? Were jealous, they didn't like him. Sell him into slavery. Joseph, he served as second in command to Pharaoh and ended up providing a way to save his own family as well as the people of Egypt during a future famine. Hmm. He served as second in command to Pharaoh. Sounds to me like he was involved in government and politics. How about King David? Yeah, we talk about David. No, 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 no. King David. Hey, you don't get any higher in government and politics than that. King. King David wrote 75 of the Psalms. How about King Solomon? Well, there's the title again. You don't get any higher in government and politics than King, do you? King Solomon. He wrote Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, and it was the principal writer of Proverbs. And he was king. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown in the fiery furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar fired up the furnace seven times hotter. And what'd they do? What, what did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do? They stood. Having done everything to prepare to take their stand, they didn't bow. Having done everything to take their stand, they stood when everybody else around them bowed. They were set over the affairs of the province of Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. They were set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Sounds to me like they were involved in government and politics. How about you? How about Daniel? Daniel's a pretty amazing. I loved the story of Daniel as a kid. Daniel's thrown into the lion's den, and I just picture Daniel just hanging out with the lions at night. Curls up with, with a male lion with the big old mane, because that's nice and soft and cushy. Had a pillow there and snuggled up next to the, the lion. That's pretty cool. We remember that. How many of you realize, how many of you know that Daniel was an appointed government official under four kings. I'd say that he was involved in government politics, wouldn't you? So we have all of these illustrations in the Bible, and yet we still have people saying, oh, we shouldn't get involved in government and politics. That's the reason we're in the mess that we're in. God established government. God established government. We saw that in Genesis chapter 9. He wants us involved in it. He wants us to teach those in government 
to observe everything Jesus commanded us. What can we teach the government, you say? I'm glad you ask. Here's just a few examples. Matthew chapter 19 covers no-fault divorce and the definition of marriage. Oh, the definition of marriage. <gasps> oh, we can't talk about that. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. I got a real problem with trying to redefine a term. Okay, now, people will make the argument about what the Constitution says or doesn't say. You know what? I'm not even going to mess with that argument. I'm going to give you that one. I'll just say it says it in the Constitution. I don't care because this predates the Constitution by a little bit. It's a couple thousand years. No big deal. The definition was before the founding of this nation. How about Luke chapter 19? Rewarding profit makers. Man, all we hear is slamming people for making a profit. It's not what the Bible teaches. Luke chapter 19 is about rewarding profit makers. Rewarding them. Why would you reward those evil profit makers? Well, I'll tell you why. I've never in my life worked for a broke person. Nobody standing in an unemployment line ever offered me a job. And guess what? With profit, you have the ability to bless others. Pastor Max Sin is so thankful and so grateful for the ATV and the planter that this church sent to him. Somebody in here had to profit in order to have that money to donate to give those things. We need to quit bashing profit makers. We just need to teach them where to put their profit. How about Matthew chapter 20? Opposition to the minimum wage. Really? Yeah, really. It's in there. Employer-employee contracts. It's in there? Yeah, it's in there. How about John chapter 8? The right of legal confrontation. Really? That's in there? Yep, it's in there. Remember what we said about being prepared? We carry the sword of the Spirit. We need to know what the Bible teaches. And as a, a, a church as a whole, I'm not talking about here at Oak Grove. I'm, taking, I'm talking about the church as a whole has, has failed in knowing what the Bible teaches. Or we've ignored it, one or the other. As a homework challenge, I've included with your notes on the back side a, a list of topics for you to look up and find Bible verses regarding those topics. Because guess what? They're in there. Every one of them. Finally, how do we do this? Well, some of you here need to run for school board. Others need to attend the meetings. Some of you need to run for city council. Others, county council. Others of you just need to attend those meetings. Maybe someone here will be called to run for mayor or a state representative. Our job is to make a difference. God expects us to. He expects us to. How important is it for us to stand and act? Well, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38 says this. My righteous one will live by faith... My righteous one will live by faith. I think we're all in agreement there, right? My righteous one will live by faith. And if he draws back, I have no pleasure in him. Whew. That's kind of heavy. How many times have we been guilty of drawing back? We were afraid to speak up. We were afraid of backlash. We were afraid of punishment. We were afraid of being kicked off of Facebook. Hi, Facebook. Um, I don't care. My job is to speak the truth. Speaking in love. That's what we have to offer the other side, doesn't it? The other side offers hate. We offer love. But the only way we're truly loving is if we tell the truth. Because if you're not telling the truth, you're not really loving. Hello? If you're not telling the truth, you're not really loving. If you're not telling the truth, you're being deceptive. And if you're being deceptive, that's not loving. We've got to speak the truth. Because if we draw back, 
God will have no pleasure in us. Wow. I'd say that's pretty important. Lastly, I was recently listening to a message by David Barton. For those of you who do not know who David Barton is, he's a brother in Christ who started wallbuilders.org. He is a foremost authority on American history. He was teaching about the first four battles of the American Revolution. These battles were not won by George Washington. How many know that? The first four battles of the American Revolution were not won by George Washington and his men. The first four battles of the American Revolution were fought by pastors leading men from their churches. What's the lesson here? The lesson here is that when you win enough local battles, you win the national victory. If it hadn't been for the local church fighting those local battles in their communities, Lexington, Concord, Boston, forget the fourth one right now. Anyway, those four battles, if, if the local church hadn't gotten involved in winning those battles, we wouldn't be a United States of America. And what an amazing blessing this nation has been. What a wonderful blessing it's been to be in this nation, to be born and raised in this nation, to know freedom and liberty, to be able to worship God and speak His name in the, in the public square. It started with pastors winning local battles. David Barton made a point, and, and, and I love David Barton, and he said this. He says he has about 120 friends in Congress. 120. Okay, I, I know some people in government. God has blessed me. I, I am a very well-connected individual. Um, part of that is because I am not shy or backward, if, if you hadn't figured that out. I don't mind walking up and meeting somebody. I don't care how big their title is. But I don't know 120 congressmen. He knows 120 congressmen. Well enough to call them friends. And they call each other, talk on the phone. They text back and forth. He has friends on the Supreme Court. They call each other and text each other. This is a connected dude. I mean, this dude's connected. And he said this. He said, I, I, I have no impact on what happens at a national level. Man, if a dude's that connected and he can't make an impact at the national level, well, let's just give up and go home. No! Having prepared to take your stand, stand there for. Take your stand. The point David was making was as, as influential as he is, as many people as he knows, he can't do it at the national level. It starts here. You know what? We're blessed. We're blessed to live in the area we live in. We don't face some of the things that local churches face in California, New York. We don't deal with a lot of those issues that they deal with. But guess what? We better pray. We better be prepared. Because if we don't proceed, it's coming to us. So we've got to stand our ground in our local community. And churches around the United States are going to take their stand in their local community. And guess what? We're going to win enough local battles that we're going to have a national victory in the name of Jesus. Let me end with some really great news because that was kind of heavy. That was kind of heavy, right? Yeah, oh man, that was coming. Okay, yeah, let me, let me give you some great news. Some believers in Missouri have been acting. How many of you saw the news? How many know where I'm going with this? Okay. Missouri, this past week, became the first abortion-free state. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't get an abortion in Missouri today. you got to travel out of state to get one. Why is that? Because the army of God, God's children, got involved and they acted. They did the proceed part of the plan. And they shut down one abortion clinic. And then another one. And then another one. And then another one. 
and it spread until now, Missouri is an abortion-free state. Folks, we got to get involved, and we got to proceed, and we got to win the local battle. And when enough churches get the fire and get woke up, and they do the proceed part of the plan, we're going we're gonna to see this nation turn around. It'll be a miracle of God. But guess what? I serve a miracle-working God. How about you? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to stand here and deliver the message that I feel that you have put on me all week long. God, I thank you that in the midst of the resistance of the enemy with this cold and congestion and the sneezing and the eye problem, you saw me through to victory. I thank you for victory. I thank you, God. I serve you, God, who knows no defeat. You've never lost, ever. You're a God of victory. Now, God, lead us into battle and show us where we are to fight and lead us on to victory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Stand and worship with us as we close this morning.
Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your people. Lord, we thank you for the word that came this morning. Lord, help us to be changed today that we will pray, that we will prepare, and that we can proceed in victory with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we have an announcement by our Zach. Our Zach. Hello. I guess I'm your Zach. Aren't there a few Zachs here, though? I mean, I was... Anyway, wow, this is a fancy Bible. Sorry, ADHD. Okay, so um, last week I mentioned this. Uh, we're having a kind of uh, meeting and information time next week, next Sunday, for um, my mission to Japan. Um, so, as Hollywood talked about this morning, um, I have prayed, and I'm trying to prepare, and I need your help to prepare so I can then proceed to Japan. So, yeah, you like that? <laughs> Thank you. I was listening today. I mean, every week. Sorry, Steve. Um, anyway, uh, so, yeah, I'm just going to be talking about my mission to Japan, um, how you can get involved, how you guys can help me get there, how we can be working together to uh, spread the gospel around the world. So not just America needs Jesus. The rest of the world needs Jesus, too. So um, some information for you guys now. I do have all these little like bookmarks and these little cards in the back. These are just like prayer cards. And if you like the refrigerator magnets, you can get one of those too, one of those. Um, this is just another way that you can kind of keep me in your thoughts, keep me in your prayers, um, help me to get there. Um, and if you want to give or financially or be a prayer partner, I have these brochures back there as well. This little page on the left side here, that is kind of where you sign up to be a financial partner or a prayer partner rip off that page. It gives you the address at the bottom. You mail that in to send. Um, you can give electronically or check monthly. Either way, they can work with you on how to do that. And um, if you guys don't know, my big board is covered in these little cards. And they say, like, I will give $25 a month to Zach while he's in Japan. And if all of those cards are gone off of that board, that's half of my funding right there. And if you're thinking, wow, Zach, that's a lot, you're right, because Japan's not a cheap place to live. <laughs> I'm not going to, like, Africa where the dollar goes really far. This is the third strongest economy on the planet, and so it's not cheap to live there. And I need lots of help from you guys to get me there. So if you want to know more about that, we're meeting next week after second service over in the hall. I realize that's lunchtime, and some of you are going to be hungry. So we'll have at least some snacks for you, but we might have some food as well. Um, but yeah, over in the hall after church, probably like noonish. And if you know anybody who would be interested in being a part of this, you can let them know too, and then just come over, and we'll talk. And if there's if we have to do social distancing and keep everyone apart, we'll have multiple opportunities to have this kind of meeting so more people can come. So that is all I wanted to say, except thank you. All right. We encourage you to read your bulletins for updates and announcements. There are also um, prayer and praise um, sheets in the back. Um, take one of those on your way out. Go and be blessed in the Lord today. <laughs> 